Remember that time Disney made a kids movie where a man's wife and children get violently ripped off the census and his only remaining son is left physically disabled? Only for that same son to get kidnapped by a trafficker and now the father has to travel hundreds of miles across predator populated hoods with only the help of a severely mentally handicapped woman. Yeah, Finding Nemo is crazy. I'm gonna destroy your favorite movie with science, and here's a challenge, take a shot, or a hit cause you know, 420. Every time a main character should have become a chalk outline, your grandkids will be an AA at the end. So it starts with a Barracuda clapping virtually Nemo's entire bloodline, and here's where we get our first problem. Barracuda don't eat clownfish or their eggs, but you know who do? Clownfish themselves. Clownfish have been known to spawn kill and eat their own eggs, so Nemo's mother would have been infinitely more of a threat to him than any Barracuda could have been. Now, to be fair, if you ask the clownfish how they like their eggs, they'd probably say unfertilized, cause those and damaged ones are the ones they'd usually eat, i.e. the ones that wouldn't make it anyway. But that goes against my narrative, so I'ma disregard it. The other elephant to address is how clownfish breed. Clownfish are sequential hermaphrodites, where every clownfish is born a male, and the biggest, most him male will transition into a female when the opportunity arises. Such an opportunity would be if a hypothetical barracuda took the alpha female on a dinner date with Batman's parents. That void would get filled by the biggest male clownfish in the area, and his spot would get filled by the second biggest male, and the two would proceed to mate with each other. And since the only clownfish we see in the entire movie are father and son, I'll let you fill in those dots. Clownfish aren't the only fish that switch teams. The Asian sheep's head rats does the same, but in reverse, they go from female to male. Although with a face for radio, you will not see them on a movie poster. If Nemo and Marlin having the worst form of family therapy wasn't bad enough, there's a good chance Nemo wasn't ever even alive. What if I told you Nemo means no one in Latin? Which means the movie title makes the theory that Marlin married Itachi suddenly gained legs. He also could have been named after Captain Nemo from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. But that goes against my narrative, so I'm gonna disregard it. It's easy for facts to get lost in favor of a better story, and if you don't know where to look, you'd have no way of knowing. Like, you may have heard that the administration started putting tariffs on penguins. Now, personally, I think it's been time those business chickens ponied up. They've had it too good for too long. But I gotta pretend to be partial. So that's why I'm working with Ground News. Ground News is an app and website developed by a former NASA engineer who did not like the way she'd seen information be used as a weapon and how news outlets tend to prey on their users' biases. And remember, if you think you're immune to bias, then you're exactly who they're looking for. But Ground News counters that by grabbing all the world's headlines in one place so you get the luxury of comparing coverage. There's no tunnel vision here. With Ground News, you can get the full picture and truly be in Formed. Like with the whole penguin taxation, here you can see it was covered by 435 sources and in terms of bias distribution, 36% were relatively centered, with 40 and 24% left and right leaning respectively. You can also see that 82% of sources were marked as highly factual. Not too bad. And additionally, with the comparison feature, you can see that left literature mocked the policy for placing 10% imposts on islands only populated by penguins and pinnipeds, and right writers defended the tariffs, highlighting benefits and even a possible boon for the economy, as the overall tariffs have raised US duty imports to the highest scene in a century. And that's the great thing about ground news, my penguin prejudice had me convinced I was on the right side of history, but after looking deeper, I don't think this is about penguins at all. Also, the blind spot feature shifts your crosshairs to stories one side may have left out, such as climate change and non-native species making life better in difficulty for native fish. So, if you're chronically online and would like ground news in your toolkit, if you use my link, you'll get 40% off the same $5 a month vantage plan I'm using. Make sure you go to groundnews.com slash casualgeo or use the QR code on screen to subscribe. And until you do, I'm controlling the narrative now. Nemo's mom passed tense her progeny, and his father's going Marlin to Marlene as soon as he gets off screen. All right, so Noah, I mean Nemo, is going to school, and when we get there, we meet these guys. And I remember, as a kid, I was not sure what Pearl was. Well, she's a young flapjack octopus. They're remarkably adorable in real life. Problem is, if this were real life, she'd be a lot less cute. The flapjack can be found in depths as far down as 1,500 meters, or 100 meters short of a mile, or about three and a half Empire State buildings. And since this pink repellent hat can withstand crushing pressure, if she existed where Nemo could see her, she would be turned into disfigured mush. Think about how getting pulled out of their habitat turns a normal looking blobfish into a deflated misshapen whale fetus. That's a whole course that got memed, and Pearl being where the sun shines would reduce her to flamingo vomit. Also at one point, Pearl says this about her arm. It's actually shorter than all my other tentacles. Well, octopus usually have one shorter arm called the hectocotylus, and its job is to deliver baby batter directly to the female, and in some species, it detaches for the female to swim off with like a Costco coitus card. In fact, the bedroom arm might have a mind of its own since it can swim to the female and it's believed it can even sense danger. So two things, Pearl's not a girl and that 
is an indecency charge. And that's not the last time we go down that road either. Now we're gonna ignore the fact that Flapjacks don't actually have a hectocot list because that goes against my name. So after Nemo sees his first pink slip, we then meet Mr. Ray. Not to be confused with the op of the Irwins, because Steve wouldn't even want that. But also because Mr. Ray is a manta ray, non-venomous and completely harmless. Now I don't know if they did this on purpose, but they chose arguably the smartest fish in the ocean to be their teacher. Manta rays are considered the most intelligent, with the largest brain to body ratio of any fish. The overachieving aquatic placemat is apparently capable of problem solving and advanced communication. They're also self-aware, with more than one occasion of a manta ray checking itself out in a mirror, and they were even caught waving and blowing bubbles at their own reflection, and just for reference, that's not how they'd react to another manta. Some mantas have even been on record asking divers for help removing hooks, so yeah, makes sense this one would have a teaching degree. Anyway, Mr. Ray gives the kids a marine magic carpet ride through the reef. Stop, right there. As a kid, it used to drive me crazy that I didn't know what that was. Years later, I have the answer. Spanish Dancer. This Pacific Pancake is a nudibranch, aka a type of giant sea slug, and a species known as a Spanish Dancer, named after the flowing frills of a flamenco performer. It looks a lot like what Spongebob got caught watching in 4K, and ironically, Sponge is what they eat, and they'll actually steal their toxins for their own use. It's essentially cultural appropriation with poison. They also play for both sides, but unlike clownfish, they're born with both equipment. Now for how they use it. Well, sometimes two slugs will donate nativity nectar to each other and head on their way. Some sea slugs have two penile appendages, one for delivering baby batter, and the other to stab their partner through the head to release a substance believed to brainwash the receiver into accepting their love juice while internally rejecting that of a rival. How do Spanish dancers do it? I don't know. I honestly stopped looking because I can only read the words traumatic insemination so many times. Also in the movie, that specific dancer has a name. Canonically, it's Maria. Or I guess Mario. I guess both. So anyway, you know how the story goes. Eventually they get to the drop off, the kids start doing the type of shit that got Harambe packed, and Nemo decides he really wants to live up to his name and gets himself kidnapped. His father tries to save him, but gets flash banged by a camera. And yeah, that's accurate. A camera flash might not kill a fish, but it's severely disorienting and like a forced factory reset. That's why they say no flash photos in an aquarium. One time a tuna mistook a flash for a fish and proceeded to one shot itself into the glass in front of several children. So I take it back. I guess it could have murked Marlin if it made him split his skull on a piece of coral. A little while after that, we get to Dory. She's a regal blue tang and a species of surgeon fish that gained a lot of clout from the movie. She's also venomous with a caudal spine that extends whenever the fish is stressed, meaning Dory has a built-in prison shift. Not only can it cause severe pain and deep cuts, you're also liable to catch a nasty bacterial infection. That's why they're called surgeon fish because they will cut you. Dory would also conceal carry a toxin called ciguatera, and poisoning can lead to migraines, trouble breathing, and hallucinations. So yeah, the beloved Disney character can be a real headache to deal with in real life, although to be fair, I've heard the same said about her voice actor. Not long after that, we meet Bruce, and considering he expeditiously kidnaps and essentially escorts them to an underwater white van, he might just be a predator in every sense. But when we see all three sharks, they swear by vegetarianism. We also see this guy. Remember him, he's gonna be important. Now there actually are vegetarian sharks, more than half of the bonnethead sharks diet is seagrass. And turns out whale sharks eat a massive amount of green. But considering we're talking about a great white, a hammerhead, and a mako, the only thing saving a clownfish and a blue tang is they're technically too small to even be worth the effort. Also when Jaws cries about never knowing his father, it's because many sharks exhibit multiple paternity where one litter can have several fathers. Shark mommy's womb is like a baby batter booyah baits where paternity is like a lottery system. That was really gross. I'm. I'ma tone it down. But yeah, Bruce has no way of knowing who his father is. But it could be worse, baby sand tiger sharks will cannibalize their siblings while in utero, and we know that because one time a scientist tried to slide his hand inside a pregnant shark's nookie and almost got his finger bit off. Okay, so later on Marlin and Dory decide to dive into God's blind spot. Now ignoring the fact that the pressure should have popped their eyes out and pushed their organs out of their mouths, they nearly get sent to a Tupac concert by... Anglerfish. Now fun fact, if you watch the credits, that anglerfish lives a vorophilic wet dream when it gets swallowed by the little anxiety guppy from earlier. Funny thing is, You're not that it'd guy, be though. the other way around. Anglerfish can distend their jaws and stomach and swallow prey physically bigger than they are. They extend so far that it inspired one man to pleasure himself with a dead anglerfish's stomach, which promptly sent him to the hospital. Should've sent him to solitary confinement, that is a hell of a hear me out, the kind that should forfeit your right to human contact. It's not long after that that we meet a lot of 90s kids first introduction to rage if these moonfish were humans in 2025, 
They be kick streamers. In real life, fish will use this shoaling strategy to intimidate predators using the hive mind method. On a large scale, it's pretty cool. It makes sharks swimming through them look like an etch a sketch. But when predators like tuna gang up on them, it turns the bait ball into a slaughter. Also, just as a callback, the reflection of the sunlight off the prey scales is exactly why a camera flash can make a tuna crash. Out, that is. Now, let's talk about Nemo. Cause Buddy would have really become a no one before he ever saw his dad. Let me tell you about osmosis. No. So diffusion just means molecules will move from one area of high concentration to low concentration, and osmosis is that, but for water. Stay with me now, as a saltwater fish, Nemo would normally have a higher concentration of water inside him than outside, so high to low, water would leave him like his mother left the mortal plane. To avoid meeting her, Nemo would have to take in water while his kidneys work to pump the salt out. But put him in fresh water and the opposite happens, now the concentration of water would be higher outside Nemo than inside, so high to low, Nemo would get internally waterboarded. So Nemo being flushed in a freshwater sewage plant means he would not make the sequel as his cells would swell and rupture and he'd get packed up by water poisoning. Also fun fact, one line in this movie led to the deaths of thousands. You wanna guess what it was? All drains lead to the ocean, kid. Just like that, Disney sent countless amounts of pet fish to the gulag at the hands of dumbass little kids and if I had fish at the time, I would have been one of them. It also inspired children to set their goldfish free in the wild. Giant Goliath goldfish is why you do not do that. It's a bug-eyed invasive that's basically a nuke to the natural habitat. Now I'm not blaming the movie for this, but their hands aren't clean. The irony is, a movie about letting fish be turned a lot of wild fish into pets and a lot of pet fish into the wild. Anyway, back to the father. Eventually they both get taken by a whale. And oh boy, there is a lot to unpack here. Stay with me now, that was a blue whale. Not only are they the biggest things alive ever, it takes so much energy for them to open their mouths, they only do it when they're guaranteed enough krill calories. Not only that, blue whales take in so much water in the process, we're talking 10,000 gallons or like 200 bathtubs. The effort it takes to carry all that means the blue whale can barely move. So yeah, Bluey would have been physically incapable of carrying them to Sydney. But even if they could, Nemo still would have come out of it an orphan. When blue whales hold all that water, they squeeze that water out with their tongue and anything not water gets trapped in their baleen, it's how they filter feed. Which means our fish friends would have been crushed to death by an 8,000 pound tongue. That's the weight of an elephant. Also, it would have been physically impossible for the whale to shoot them off at Sydney, since the blue whale's mouth does not connect to its blowhole. Also, also, whales don't shoot water out of their blowholes. It's really just warm whale lung air meeting cool outside sea air with some mucus, and it smells like a tire factory married the final boss of tonsil stones. So if smell kills, they would have got a guest past the fish hell. But ignoring all that, eventually they trade one live uber for another when a friendly pelican saves them from a flock of hungry seagulls. Seagulls are a feathery antichrist and the spawn of Satan. And they should be afraid of pelicans, since pelicans are documented literally swallowing birds alive. In fact, one of the most traumatizing documentaries I watched was where Cape Gannis were nesting on Malgus Island by the thousands, but because of overfishing, great white pelicans started pulling up to the nursery. What followed was a bunch of today pterosaurs strolling across the island like a grocery aisle, and swallowing any unsupervised chicks alive. Like, you could hear the chicks as they were sliding down their throats. Only for the pelicans to fly home, just to regurgitate the recently devoured baby birds for their own pelican chicks to eat. So yeah, Nigel might be the real villain here. Now that didn't really have to do with the plot, but I just sat here and overanalyzed a kid's movie from 2003 because I have nothing better to do. And if this video gets 150,000 likes, I'll do it to another one. You can probably guess which one. Friendly reminder that I do have a Patreon if you'd like to support me beyond subscribing, but as always, in this economy, don't spend a check on a creator that, let's be honest, really doesn't need it. Only if you want to like buy me lunch or something. Also, I have a book. You should read it. Link also in description. But that's gonna do it. Drink water, hug your mother, don't dump goldfish, that's for real a problem. My condolences to your childhood. I will be doing it again. But until then, I'ma see y'all in the next one.